Hello, on today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing COPD exacerbations. First up, what is a COPD exacerbation? The definition has evolved over time. The most recently adopted definition, a change in the patient's typical symptoms of COPD that leads to a change in medical therapy or requires hospitalization, well, that feels completely circular to me. So I actually prefer a slightly older definition an event in the natural course of the disease characterized by a change in the patient's baseline dyspnea, cough, and or sputum that is beyond the normal day-to-day variations and is acute in onset. And by acute, that time course is more specifically over several hours to several days. In addition to the symptoms, there are many common physical findings in COPD exacerbations. They include tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypoxemia, wheezing, Decreased breath sounds, which are usually described as poor air movement. The use of accessory muscles, such as the sternocleidomastoids. Speaking in short sentences. The tripod position, in which the patient sits upright, leaning forward with their hands or forearms resting on their knees or a bedside table. And altered mental status, which suggests a particularly severe gas exchange abnormality. Unfortunately, none of these findings are specific for COPD, but the more in which are present, the more support there will be for the diagnosis. Watch out for the common mimics of COPD exacerbations, including bacterial and viral pneumonia, heart failure, and PE. In fact, in one autopsy study that identified the most common causes of hospital death in patients who had been admitted with a COPD exacerbation, all of these were more common than COPD itself. After identifying a probable COPD exacerbation, it's also important to identify a trigger. Four common triggers are bacterial pneumonia, respiratory viruses, air pollution, and medication non-adherence. We see that pneumonia shows up twice here, as both a mimic and as a trigger, highlighting how tricky it can be to establish a precise diagnosis for these patients. For patients with a possible COPD exacerbation, initial testing should include a chest x-ray, an ECG, an ABG in most patients sick enough to warrant admission, and in some patients, an evaluation for pulmonary embolism. These tests are to help identify those triggers and mimics. In whom should you consider a PE evaluation? I consider it in any patient who has either features that are atypical for a CPD exacerbation, including a highly abrupt onset, increased dyspnea as the sole symptom, pleuritic chest pain, or a decreased PaCO2 compared to baseline, active malignancy, or a history of venous thromboembolism. So now I'll move on to discuss the specific treatments, bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics, oxygen, and BiPAP. And I'll start with bronchodilators. Everyone diagnosed with a COPD exacerbation should get them. Most patients should receive both albuterol and ipratropium. The uncommon exceptions are related to the fact that albuterol is relatively contraindicated in patients with unstable tachyarrhythmias, and ipratropium is relatively contraindicated in patients prone to urinary retention. The effectiveness of meter dose inhalers and nebulizers are essentially the same, but only if patients are able to use good technique, which most older patients in respiratory distress cannot. So it's typical to start everyone with nebulizers, but once a patient has improved, it is usually okay to switch them over to an inhaler. Although Lev albuterol, marketed in the US as Zopinex, is often used instead of albuterol in patients prone to tachyarrhythmias, there is insufficient evidence to conclude whether or not this is helpful. And the short-term concurrent use of teotropium and ipratropium is probably safe, but some hospital pharmacies do not allow it. When it comes to steroids, almost everyone sick enough to come to the ED or to be admitted should get systemic steroids. Only critically ill patients, however, should receive IV over oral. The optimal dose and duration of steroids is unknown, but a general consensus is that anything within prednisone, 30 to 60 milligrams daily for 5 to 14 days, either with or without a taper, is defensible. Personally, I would only rarely advocate for beyond 10 days and would only rarely advocate for a taper. Regarding antibiotics, most patients sick enough to warrant admission should also receive antibiotics, irrespective of the presence of overt infection. 
The specific choice depends upon likely pathogens, severity of exacerbation, risk factors for poor outcome, risk factors for pseudomonal colonization, and local resistance patterns. A five-day course is probably just as good as a longer course and with fewer side effects, though the duration in patients with concurrent clinical pneumonia should be dictated by that latter diagnosis. With oxygen, only provide it to achieve a peripheral O2 sat of 88 to 92%. Targeting higher sats risks worsening hypercapnia. Consider BiPAP in patients with an acute respiratory acidosis or who subjectively appear in respiratory distress. Finally, what are the considerations prior to discharge? Anyone still smoking obviously needs smoking cessation counseling. Ensure that the patient is up to date with their pneumococcal and influenza vaccinations. Evaluate whether the patient would benefit from home oxygen. And if your patient qualifies for HOMO2 and is still smoking, please discuss the very real risks from that combination. Consider whether the patient would benefit from pulmonary rehab. And last, consider whether the patient would be appropriate for a palliative care consult. Keep in mind that palliative care does not necessarily equal hospice. A palliative care specialist can help prepare a patient and their family for the gradual terminal decline in respiratory function and the frequent hospitalizations that many patients with advanced COPD unfortunately experience.